Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're also live streaming uh, this meeting and uh, later on we'll upload uh, the video to YouTube. So it will be accessible in the program library put online. So we are going to have, in addition to these videos, some publications, including policy papers by our staff and associated experts covering all five project models. This program organized by the Center for Policy Studies includes five models uh, on the Central European countries policy regarding the Eastern Partnership, then civil and security sector reform, healthcare and social policy, renewable energy, development, and finally, IT sector, governance and information society. And I'm very glad to welcome a very prominent expert from Slovakia today, Professor Alexander Duleva, who has been with the Slovak Foreign, Foreign, Slovak Foreign Policy Association Research Center for many years. And I'm glad that he will uh, present the, the Slovak perspective on the Eastern Partnership. And as unfortunately the previous time because of connection problems, we had to postpone the meeting. May I ask Ambassador Hatsi to say a few words again, if possible. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, once again, I would like to present the result of uh, our entry to Armenian soil. It was with great pleasure that uh, I am representing uh, the first diplomatic mission here in Yerevan. And uh, we have uh, succeeded to open the new Slovak embassy in Yerevan with the presence of former Minister of Foreign Affairs Miroslav Lajcev in February this year. And uh, the fact that we have opened our new embassy here in Yerevan has uh, appeared here as a result of uh, previous very intensive uh, political dialogue with uh, Armenia and uh, of course it was a natural progress in the presence of the Slovak foreign representation in different regions. Uh, starting from this fact, uh, we are now in the stage to build the capacities of the embassy and uh, of course the main task is to put into the practice the concept of uh, our cooperation with Armenia in every field of common interest. And uh, in this regard, I would like to underline few basic points which are creating valuable soil of uh, our mutual cooperation. And uh, I can express myself that I'm glad that our bilateral relations have continually improved. There was a lot of bilateral contacts on different levels and uh, Slovakia has a serious intention to step up the cooperation with Armenia, especially we would like to bring a new impetus to the further development of our bilateral relations in all the areas where we are interesting, uh, especially, and I would like to underline this uh, aspect, the economic diplomacy. To promote 
direct contacts between major business stakeholders of our countries as well as a partnership on the level of uh, small and medium enterprises. We see a particular potential in the field like agriculture, food industry, IT sector, waste management, power generation, of course, renewable energy, hydropower plants, and especially tourism. Tourism as a uh, limited globally nowadays, but we have a potential to connect not only Armenians living here in uh, the country, but also Armenian diaspora. And uh, for them, it would be very fruitful to present Slovakia as a valuable hub in the heart of Europe. And this is our intention. And coming out of this bilateral level, of course, uh, I have to mention that uh, Slovakia entered Yerevan as a 10th European Union membership country in row. And we are then reinforcing the EU presence here in the country. And with European ideas being so attractive to people here, we are keen to share our values visions and expertise. And of course, we are also keen to share our transformation experiences and best practices, which in very practical way might be of help to Armenia in avoiding mistakes with it. And this might sound banal, but in the end, uh, it saves not only money, but also, it saves a people trust, dedication, and readiness to necessary and vital reforms. And in this regard, I will just jump briefly into this valuable program of cooperation with not only Armenia, but also other neighboring countries, Eastern Partnership. And I would like to underline few moments which are already a part of the Slovak foreign policy priorities. The implementation of reforms in partner countries and progress in the areas of rule of law, democracy, human rights, and freedoms face challenges. And the priority of the Slovak Republic will be to maintain the strategic and ambitious nature of the Eastern Partnership and supported by adequate funding with strengthened and uh, differentiated bilateral partnership dialogue, we are emphasizing on gradual integration of partners into the EU's internal market and building partners' resilience to both internal and external challenges. And at the end, I would like to express my internal satisfaction that Armenia is presenting itself not only as a neighboring country, but as a partnership country. And this is the main fact we would like to support in full. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Indeed, uh, we value the development of cooperation very much. and. Uh, as you mentioned, some of the possibilities have been postponed by the pandemic, but hopefully in a few weeks or months, the situation may improve, especially if uh, there is finally some vaccine available. In any case, uh, the cooperation is developing even in this situation, and, and both on diplomatic, political level, and also between um, higher education institutions and policy researchers and so on. So, uh, uh, I mentioned once uh, that I'm also glad to see the. Uh, Slovak embassy in Yerevan, finally, because some seven years ago it was considered a distant perspective. So, uh, 
at the Slovak Foreign Ministry, they didn't know uh, exact date when when that should happen. Uh, so me and my colleagues are very much looking forward to this cooperation, of course. And now it is my pleasure to pass the floor to Professor Duleva for his presentation on Slovak perspective on the Eastern Partnership. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, uh, dear Armen, hope you can hear me and actually that everything will work well today. And uh, simply I will have, uh, so thank you very much for giving me, me this opportunity to share with you my sort of the explanation or understanding of Slovakia's approach to resistant partnership. And uh, so I prepared a couple of slides <clears throat> and uh, my presentation will take around maybe 20, 30 minutes. I'm open to all your questions. And actually I understand my toast today to do my best simply to share with you my understanding and explanation what Slovakia, what, 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 what is Slovakia's sort of Eastern policy and what's Slovakia's approach towards the Eastern partnership. And let me start from the first, this map. You can see a political map of Slovakia, including the borders uh, with our neighbors. And uh, simply we have to start from the very fact, which does matter in a Slovak discourse that Ukraine is our neighbor. And uh, if I, I do not want to burden you with the uh, socioeconomic statistics when it comes to the development of the Slovakia's region, but uh, if you look at the Bratislava, western part of Slovakia, surrounding areas, including uh, Trenčín, I mean Trnava, Žilina. So these are the most developed parts of Slovakia. And actually most of investments, new jobs created over the last 20 decades came to this part. And it is connected mostly with the uh, car industry. I will explain because this car industry phenomenon played an important role in Slovakia's foreign policy. And also it has to do, it's also very important to understand that in the context of Slovakia's Eastern. What are basis or fundamentals for this really booming car industry in Slovakia? We will see how things will develop because actually automotive industry was very much uh, affected by the COVID-19, but we are still calculating what it will mean for Slovakia and especially this very important sector, which actually shares around 40% of the GDP, gen GDP generation in Slovakia, also 40% of the Slovakia's exports. But the fundamentals uh, to understand why it happened that so many investors came to Slovakia, simply, especially in this uh, sector, it is very much connected with our history within the communists, sort of the period of our history. And actually, I would say that those numbers uh, overlap with the former economic statistics that say that actually 40% of Slovak economy in the 80s, in the second half of 80s, before the Velvet Re Re Revolution and, and regime changes, was military oriented. Slovakia, Czechoslovakia was known as a, you know, one of the uh, top exporters of heavy military uh, equipment like tanks, artillery, but it was concentrated, especially in Slovakia and in the western part of Slovakia. So it's not only that actually, yes, definitely, I mean, um, uh, we attracted investors into the sector only after we implemented reforms. And finally, when it became clear for Slovakia that we will join the EU and NATO. And especially, I would say the first two governments of led by Mikovac Zurinda, I will refer to them, couple of times in my presentation. So they managed to convert this sort of the heavy military industry on the production of civil cars. So engineers like just, I will stop the story here, uh, that Volkswagen Bratislava, the Volkswagen uh, factory in Bratislava is number one in the whole, the global group of Volkswagen because Volkswagen runs companies, you know, or the production uh, sort of generation capacities in many countries uh, in the world. But the Bratislava factory is number one in the whole group when it comes to the quality of production. And it is why actually the most uh, complicated and sophisticated cars are now produced within the Volkswagen group 
in Bratislava. And why? Because actually we developed during the former regime uh, this base of uh, engineers and skills and education and expertise in the field of engineering. And why it is important to understand because it's a structural factor uh, for, slow, for the development and reform of the Slovak economy that actually in the 90s, the uh, first Slovak government led, uh, first three Slovak governments led by uh, former Prime Minister Vladimir Mečiar, they believe that they will simply save this industry in close cooperation with Russia because actually all the tanks and artillery pieces and so on were produced under Soviet licenses and later on under Russian licenses. And actually this is why he was looking at the East, you know, believing that actually the special relationship with Russia will help Slovakia to protect and to, to, to save jobs and simply this industrial capacity. And from this point, what happened and what I think, I think that is one of the most successes of the first two Zurinda's government was that they simply managed the structural problem of Slovak economy with a very strong impact also on how country was looking around and uh, trying to identify its interests. And again, uh, still looking at the map of Slovakia, we learned from the history of the uh, EU enlargement over the last, uh, uh, you know, starting from uh, 80s, that the regions that are uh, located on the external borders of the integration, simply they are marginalized. Simply it, 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 it's natural. If you are living in the city or sort of the, you know, the village, which is located the, in the border regions, all the border regions are much more depressed and it's possible to show on the statistics and so on. And when we looked at the story of the, how the EU was expanding and how the situation was changing gradually on the German Polish, German Czech, Austrian Czech, Austrian Slovak, Austrian uh, Hungarian borders, Good example is uh, Austrian uh, region Burgenland, which is neighboring to Bratislava. You can see here, Bratislava is right uh, on the border and next region here in this corner of Austria is uh, Burgenland, neighboring with Slovakia and Hungary. It was the most depressed Austrian region during the Cold War. When the association process of Slovakia and Hungary, and Hungary in the 90s started because we signed it we concluded the accession agreements with the European Union in 92. Then Slovakia succeeded to the two because Czechoslovakia, after the division of Czechoslovakia, simply we have two new agreements. It's the most, uh, I mean, well developing region of Austria. So the, the response is that actually our integration, the liberalization of trade, movement of capital, investments, and labor force simply help the region of Austria. And this is the, maybe one of the most, I mean, the, the, the top winners of Slovakia's and Hungary's integration to the European Union. And when we had a debate in Slovakia uh, in 2000-2002, what should be Slovakia's post-accession foreign policy priorities, we definitely learned this lesson and our interest, and I'm very much happy, and I will show it later on, that we share, I mean, the political parties in Slovakia share this sort of political consensus is that it's in our long-term interest to support European integration of Ukraine, because we see that it might become new impetus for economic development of actually the most depressed Eastern part of Slovakia. Again, I will finish here, but I'm, uh, it's really very important to understand this economic dynamics because actually political elites, they, they always try to look at the best solutions for their countries and foreign policy is a part of policies, is a part of the development strategy of your country. And you, sh you should look you, look, you have simply to look for the allies, friends, partners, and simply you should identify the positive agenda towards them because you are helping yourself. You're helping them, but at the same time, you're helping yourself. And this was this, uh, I will move uh, one step uh, ahead. And uh, this is the sort of the outcome of the foreign policy 
I mean, debate we have on, on post-accession foreign policy priorities of Slovakia 2000-2002, and we simply identified the Western Balkans and Eastern neighbors. Of course, in case of Slovakia, it's focused it's on Ukraine, definitely. So these are foreign policy priorities. And what it means, that means that actually in our interest is to support European integration of those countries to the EU as much as possible because it works for Slovakia's long-term interests. And uh, I know that, so I actually have the, here the names of the uh, Slovak prime ministers. What, what is important? It's important to understand when one wants to, wants to get more, uh, I mean, better understanding of Slovakia's approach to Eastern partnership is that uh, uh, this is consensus. And if you look at the all program statements of the old Slovak governments, starting from 2002, you will find this foreign policy priority introduced in each, uh, in, in the each statement of the each government. So we can speak that this is the sort of the real consensus in foreign policy. There might be differences, and I can elaborate briefly on why Slovakia is a bit different when it comes to especially perception of Russia. Okay, this is very specific, and especially when, uh, you know, in, uh, in the context of the last year's developments of relations between Russia and Ukraine. So this was a phenomenon which was very I mean, impacting or influencing Slovakia's foreign policy. But nevertheless, this long-term fundament of interest of foreign policy of Slovakia is to support everything that's possible in the Eastern partnership, because actually we believe that it works for Slovakia. Cynically speaking, it works for the economic development of Slovakia. It might help us to address the, our domestic internal problems with making this depressed, most depressed region of Slovakia, which is eastern part of Slovakia, more developing and booming region, at the same time helping uh, our, our neighbors. And of course, uh, Ukraine is number one in our sort of the, you know, glasses, how we see Eastern Europe. Uh, I would say that, okay, it's so the uh, Russia versus Ukraine, a Slovak Eastern dilemma. As I said, uh, uh, those the governments, I mean, Zuri, the Rad led by Prime Minister Zurin, the Radicov and Matovic, so they were more or less clear. For them, Ukraine, I, I call it, I mark this approach as a Ukraine first approach in Slovakia's foreign policy. When it comes to the Social Democrats who ruled Slovakia in the continually almost 12 last years, and the governments were led by Prime Minister Robert Fico and Pellegrini. They tried to implement the pragmatic double track approach, having good relations with Russia and with Ukraine. But it became you know, very difficult to you know, sustain such a policy, such approach, and a situation when Russia and Ukraine appeared you know, in a war, starting from 2014. And here I would like to explain a bit was, what is also very important in addition to this fundament of the Eastern policy of Slovakia of our interest in Eastern partnership, also this historic, historic historicist pro-Russian sympathy because it's really, uh, I would say it is a folklore of Slovakia's foreign policy that uh, on one side, we have this consensus over the political spectrum of Slovakia that we should support, sup, should support uh, as much as we can when it comes to everything what, 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 um, uh, what uh, is related to the Eastern partnership. But at the same time, we have this sort of the pro-Russia sort of sympathy, and we want to have a Russia on the board of the policies. It's difficult. Now it's simply impossible. But nevertheless, this, let me uh, explain you a bit this history is pro-Russia sympathy in Slovakia because it's very important. So it would take one hour for me simply to, uh, uh, you know, bring all the relevant factors which shape this sort of the history is pro-Russia sympathy in Slovakia. I would say I would rather use uh, illustration and compare historical Polish nationalism and Slovak nationalism. We are Western Slavs. We can 
easily understand poles. We can speak to each other. We do not need a sort of the interpreter or translation. When we speak, we can understand each other. We, I mean, both Poland and Slovakia, I mean, the, uh, are countries with the very high share of Roma Catholic believers. It's like 80% in the case of Slovakia. It's almost 100% when it comes to Poland. So they are cultural language, you know, sort of the proximity. But if you look at the historical axis of nationalism of Poland and Slovakia, we have different picture. To simplify it very much, <clears throat> in our history, we were looking for our allies against Budapest, against Vienna, and sometimes it happened against Prague. Poles were looking for their historical alliance against Russia and against Germany. We found our strategic allies in Berlin and in Moscow. Poles found them in London, Paris, Washington. And here you can see that this historicism or historical factors of, uh, yeah, they do much, you know, matter for the uh, foreign policy identity. I call it as a foreign policy identity because actually it's very relevant, you know, it does have an influence how, how politicians, how political elites think about interests of your country and how they see other uh, sort of uh, third countries on the scheme of your national interests, of the network of your national interests. And here I would conclude that, but I can elaborate more if you would be interested, you know, in this sort of question and answers period. But actually, my argument is, for a discussion, of course, that uh, we invented our own Russia, which maybe never existed in the history, but it became our own image of Russia, became part of foreign policy identity of Slovakia. Uh, last example, in October 2014, uh, when a uh, war cul culminated, there was the first Minsk One agreement between Russia and Ukraine. We did a research uh, in order to understand what Slovaks think about who is right, who is wrong in this conflict, what we should do with this conflict and how to approach it. And actually, we got very interesting picture. Uh, more than 80% of respondents, and this was a representative um, uh, public opinion pool uh, implemented by one of the prestigious, most presi prestigious sort of the sociological agencies in Slovakia, Focus, more, more than 80% of respondents said that actually Ukraine is independent country. Russia has no right to intervene into domestic affairs of Ukraine. And it's up to Ukrainians to decide whether they want to be part of the European Union or they want to be with Russia. More than 80%. At the same time, more than 70% of those respondents said that we should have good relations with Russia, regardless of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And here you can see, I mean, our former Prime, uh, Prime Minister Fico was many times criticized that he's like pro-Russian because sometimes he was, you know, rhetorically, he was against sanctions that you applied against Russia. But actually, you can see this, it is a sort of schizophrenia. We have it sort of schizophrenia, especially when it comes to Russia, because we do think Ukraine, uh, Russia is uh, doing bad things vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. But nevertheless, the public and citizens want the government to have a good relations with Russia. So this is a sort of very specific also, I would say, characteristic of Slovakia's foreign policy thinking and how we approach Eastern Europe. So therefore, I would like to, so, uh, to, to highlight on, on it. But against looking at the, all the program statements of the Slovak governments and the basic interests where we share the consensus across the political parties and actors in Slovakia, you see this fundamental long-term interest and that it's support European integration of Eastern European countries, Eastern partnership countries, because this works with the Slovak long-term interests. Let me go to, and because of that, because you know, many times, I mean, uh, uh, the media, and especially so in third countries, if you have some news from Slovakia, etc. 
actually media covers some scandals or some very specific highlights, but uh, rather the real work is in shadow. And here I would like to uh, again stress that all the Slovak governments since 2002, Slovakia was very actively participating in forming the Eastern Partnership, EU's Eastern Dimension, as we call it, uh, especially the beginning of, of uh, two, two, uh, 2000s. And here, just let me illustrate the real contribution of Slovakia to the implementation of the uh, sort of the EU relations with Eastern neighbors. Let me start with the Slovak Bilateral Official Development Assistance, ODA, which Slovakia was the first uh, new member states which launched the uh, official development assistance. And one should understand that actually, like I have the data for 2018, uh, we paid 89.3 million euros annually to multilateral development funds like EU8, UNDP, OECD has its development agency and other international organizations. And 23.8 million euro we have for our bilateral cooperation. And I mean, so now it's more than 100 million euros you, we pay annually to this. Uh, we invest into the development aid, which includes also technical assistance, sharing uh, experiences, reform experience, et cetera, et cetera. And I counted for you, actually, I looked through the pages of the Slovak Agency for International Development for 2003, for 2018, and I counted the Slovakia through the bilateral part of the official development assistant simply invested into the development projects and technical assistance oriented projects implemented by NGOs and businesses. And always it sh there should be a partnership. There should be Slovak entity and the given country, which is a beneficiary of Slovak aid uh, uh, entity, and this should be a joint project. Uh, actually 27 million euros. 2003-2018. It's not too much now that Slovak Ministry of Finance in 2009, it is a year when the Eastern Partnership was launched, launched its own. And it's not, uh, I mean, the sources are not counted in the bilateral order. This is a special sources of the Ministry of Finance of the Slovak Republic. They launched this activity, Public Finances for Development, and together in cooperation with the EBRD, they established, this is a Slovak EBRD bilateral deal, Fund for Technical Cooperation, which facilitates sharing of experiences between, I mean, with experts from uh, finance, ministries of other Eastern Partnership countries and the Slovak um, uh, Ministry of Finance. And the, the government, I would say that uh, 2010, uh, now it's not in the highlight of sort of the uh, Slovak politics, but still it works. Uh, Slovak government, when the Eastern Partnership was launched, initiated a special Eastern Partnership program for involvement of central Slovak authorities into the projects with their counterparts from Eastern Partnership countries. Uh, 15 ministries and state agencies participate in that. And maybe the most successful uh, case or sample, which I would like to introduce, this is a twinning project uh, implemented in 2016 and 18 by Slovak Regulatory Office for Network Industries. And actually, thanks to this project, the uh, National Energy Regulatory Authority of Ukraine was established following the Slovak model, as well as thanks to this project, the basic legislative framework for regulatory policy and reform of energy uh, sector in Ukraine was drafted. So here are some cases, I mean, uh, of the Slovakia's contribution, which illustrates that uh, thesis which I made, that we have this interest across the political spectrum, because if you would look 2003, this was during this government, center right oriented, 2009 it was Fico's government, center-right oriented. 2010, it was Radicheva government, center-right oriented. Then 2016-18, it was again Fico's government, center-left oriented. So regardless of the political colors, we have this sort of the consensus. And I try to explain you the very basic fundament when it comes to the 
stru structure of Slovak economy and our long term, how we approach our long term interests in Eastern Europe. Uh, let me go to the next uh, part of presentation. I will not go much into detail on that, but actually, this is what you, what you can see is a brief summary of national discourse. I simply took those ideas from media, political parties, governmental agencies, think tanks, academia, what we in Slovakia see, the, how we see the current state of Eastern partnership, what are main achievements and main challenges and prospects. The main achievements definitely we see these are association agreements with Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. We see that this is a major step towards implementation of our long-term interests bringing Ukraine as close to EU as possible. And if Ukraine simply implements the association agreement, yes, the border will change its nature, this border which I showed you at the very beginning, and we do believe that will be flexible border, not a barrier to the economic cooperation, trade exchange, people exchange, and, uh, and so on. So this is the consensus more or less if you will speak to any Slovak from politics, from the government, from the academia, those who think about those policy, they would say that yes, the association agreement is the uh, major uh, achievement of the Eastern partnership so far. Secondly, the very fact that, implement, that thanks to these agreements and thanks to this network, the reforms in those in Eastern partnership countries were launched. And following uh, here, at, I, I, I haven't marked it in my presentation, but actually this uh, sentence in the brackets that Ukraine implemented more reforms in the course of recent years than it did during the first two decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union is a citation of Ivan Miklos, our former vice uh, prime minister and master of finance, who did a lot, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, stabilization and reform of financial fiscal sector of Slovakia. And he served as a, a two years as a advisor to prime minister, former prime minister of, of Ukraine under uh, President Poroshenko. So you know that there was a change a year ago in Ukraine, the Zelensky new prime minister, but he was very close with the government. And this is his statement that yes, the, reform process finally started with all the problems, all the difficulties, but the strategy and the road, I mean, is there and it's clear more or less. And finally, if you look at Slovak, you know, it's also, the, I would say rather, I would highlight that it's rather a paradoxical situation because uh, uh, thanks to the migration crisis, which started 2015, you know, that there was very, I would say very sharp anti, migration rhetorics appeared in many countries, including in Slovakia. Visa free regime achieved in uh, the relations between the European Union, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia is uh, not perceived in Slovakia as a problem. Now in Bratislava, if you will go to a restaurant, actually from my office, 100 meters, you know, restaurant where we go for lunch, you have the old stuff, there are Ukrainians. If you would go to the Slovak hospitals, I'm not, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's an experience, I mean, I do not wish anyone simply to go to hospitals, but if you would go, you will also see the staff there, supportive staff. So, I mean, this is a natural process, and this is very interesting that the migration or labor migrants from Eastern partnership countries, they do not present a problem in terms of Slovak perceptions. If we have a problem uh, when it comes to the foreign migrants, it's mostly, you know, uh, connected with the migrants from Africa, from Middle East and so on, not from Eastern Europe. And so this is also, I think, rather positive. Um, uh, and this is a material achievement per se, if you want, because this is how the public responds to policies and how it, uh, how it uh, perceives I mean, the citizens of those countries. And this is really very, uh, I would say, in the context of this anti-migration sort of the rhetorics and discourse, we still have in, in not only in Slovakia, but in other countries here in the region. So this is very important achievement. This is a milestone. Main challenges, let's go to main challenges and prospects. Definitely war between Russia and Ukraine, because this, uh, 
is a problem, simply uh, is a threat. First of all, it's a threat, security threat to Slovak national European security, but also it limits capacities of Ukraine, but not only Ukraine. You know, the, the relations between Russia and Georgia are also very difficult. So in those association countries, we see that, I mean, this conflict, uh, conflictual relations with Russia, say, limits their capacities to implement the reforms. And this is the challenge. We have to address somehow it. Uh, when it comes to Eastern Partnership as a framework policy, uh, we see a sort of the uh, not well balanced relations between, uh, I mean, Eastern Partnership, sorry, uh, governments. I mean, what's the main problem? The weaker political administrative institutions and still missing dedicated political elite. Unfortunately, we do not see the political elites that might be, you know, comparable with the political elites from the 90s in uh, Central Europe. Those, even in Slovakia, it took more time, but still the political elite came, implemented dramatic necessary reforms, they paid political price, they are not or uh, they are not part of the political scene, they were they, they, they were politically killed. But if you do not have those political killers who will simply put the public interest, you know, above their own private or business activities and interests, and you will not implement the reforms. So we can see that all these post-Soviet or post-communist, you know, regimes, how they are developing in a former Eastern Bloc, you can see that without such a political elite, it's impossible to really change and Europeanize, if you want, your country. And so they are still missing such sort of political elites, you know, in Eastern partnership countries, including in Ukraine, what is not a good news for Slovakia, but we have to live it. But, you know, if you can identify your interest, doesn't matter what political party or political class will rule in the given country, you should be open, and this is European policy, and is European policy of Slovakia, offer is here, it's up to you to take how much you want, we will help you how much we can, but it's up to you to take and make decisions. So offer is there, and here Eastern Partnership works excellently with the Slovak sort of approach. Offer is there for all countries, it's up to them, their political classes, I mean elites, how much of this offer they can absorb and take. When it comes to the EU, I would say that the, what, we see as a, what we see as the main problem for Eastern Partnership is that there are too many projects. If you look at the uh, deliverables, 2020 deliver, uh, 20 deliverables for 2020, okay, it was the, more than 100 projects. There are too many projects and it looks like they are not streamlined, <clears throat> well streamlined or strategized, you know, in some uh, relevant direction. So there it's, it's, it's like, uh, is a collection of quite fragmented and too diversified number of projects. And it's, I mean, the, 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 the strategy is missing or political drive, and this is missing. Then the robust multilateral institutional framework is because actually reforms can be implemented on national level only. It might be done by Armenian government. It might be done by Moldovan, Ukrainian government but it cannot be done on multilateral level. Multilateral level, I mean, starting from the, I mean, those platforms, okay, high officials meetings and everything, panels, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really the most robust institutional structure the EU ever developed in its history, what we have within the Eastern Partnership, you know, even if you look at the Mediterranean Union, sort of the activities, you cannot compare it, would be developed, you know, this tech, I mean, uh, this robust institutional structure. And the question is how it works, what it brings. But would not it be more efficient simply to focus on national reforms if we understand that actually it's fine to have a robust multilateral structures, but in fact, the outcome and the end outcome should be, you know, implemented on national soil of those countries. It cannot be done on multilateral sort of multilateral framework. So here we see a challenge and actually so that uh, there should be find, I mean, uh, the more balanced approach of the European Union, even because it costs a lot of money. If you host in Brussels, like civil society forum, it's 500 NGOs from Eastern, you have to pay like, you know, 
everything. No, it's a lot of money. It's important to have a meeting, to speak to each other and so on, to think together, you know, but still the question is what's the real outcome and how efficient this is. Definitely during the talks when, because there was a reflection period announced by the European Commission, and you know that the basic compromise was found around the concept of resilience. Let's strengthen support resilience on, of Eastern, their institutions, everything, whatever it might be, because there are many different interpretations. What that means as a new strategic motive for Eastern Panthers to support resilience. But definitely here in Slovakia, okay, at least mostly people uh, with whom I have a chance to communicate. So we are not satisfied with this concept. And actually it was uh, argument raised by France and some other countries during the reflection period that, okay, uh, we should not do something that might provoke Russia or that what might be understood as a geopolitical project. Therefore, let's focus on this resilience and there's a compromise because you can include whatever you want in this. It's really, it's, it's a Hegelianism per se. You know, Hegel, who was a uh, well-known German philosopher and he introduced you know, these categories into, and you have the categories, you can put everything there, what you want. It, it depends on how you interpret that, but exactly. So this is how the resilience concept is understood here. Yes, fine, this is a compromise. It allows us to go farther, but still we are not satisfied with, fully with, with that. Because Slovakia supports European perspective, open European perspective. We do not see it as a geopolitical project if Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, other countries won't become the members of, we have the rules for them. If they meet them, they should be given this uh, European perspective. So and from this uh, pers uh, perspective, the resilience concept is not, uh, I would say, uh, actually, I mean, uh, the, the, the most wishful, I mean, uh, outcome we want to have, but this is a EU reality, I would say, so far. And finally, my last part of my presentation will be on deep prospects for deepening of the association process. And here I will speak on behalf of myself, because I'm going to uh, present you uh, a research of of the, I mean, uh, we did within the Slovak Foreign Policy Association, because still we are trying to understand how the association agreements of Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and even the enhanced cooperation agreement with Armenia might work, how to identify them, where they should be put in the history of the European enlargement uh, <clears throat> or European integration project per se. And here we have the uh, term so-called differentiated integration or flexible integration uh, elaborated mostly by Swiss and Norwegian experts. Because actually you know that Norway and Switzerland, Norway, Island, Liechtenstein, so-called EEA countries, European Economic Area countries, and Switzerland are the most integrated third countries that are not members of the European, institutional members of the EU, but they are part of the European project. And simply we try to understand in our research, what are modalities, how they work within the European Union, what is the institutional design of their relations, and whether it could be applied on Eastern partnership countries in order to deepen the legal regime between the EU and Eastern partnership countries. So bringing them closer as much as possible to the status of the EU members. I will firstly show you briefly some maps. I will not go into details because really I can share with Armen the first uh, sort of the outcome of this research. We, you can find it on our website, uh, uh, sfpa.sk uh, publications in 2017, uh, uh, we published the book, Ukraine Association with the, uh, sorry, it's a, uh, uh, Exactly, it's vital membership. Ukraine association uh, with the European Union or limits of, and potential of the association without membership. And actually we published uh, our findings there. So let me start for explaining the note of this differentiated integration. This is the map of the single market. You can see dark blue, the member states, 
light blue, this is EA countries, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. But, but what is interesting? In case of the EA countries, we have one comprehensive agreement similar to the comprehensive agreements the EU signed with Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and Armenia. It's very specific. I, we can elaborate then more on spec, uh, specifics of Armenian agreement. But uh, then we have, I mean, actually the orange color, you can see the uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia. Uh, these are associ association agreements. Then green color, you can see the Western Balkan countries, which uh, concluded stabilization and st association agreements. And finally, Turkey, because Turkey since 1995 has an agreement on customs union, union with the European Union, which facilitates Turkic integration into the single market. So this is the map of the single market, which is much larger than the political map or membership map of the European Union. And actually all those countries are integrated into the project. So this is the first sample. Second, this is the EC EU enlargement map, okay? But this is actually political so-called uh, map of the European Union. Here we have Eurozone, it's a different map. That is the political map or single map of the European Union. And here we have the Schengen, which is again, different map. Why I'm illustrating those, uh, I use those maps because actually differentiated integration started in the nineties. Within the intra-EU context, it means that some member countries want to, want to integrate, want to go into their sectoral or political integration deeper than the others. Within the European Union, we have around 30 sectorial policies and nine common policies. And especially when it comes to the common policies, sectorial policies are part of the single market. Then we have the common policies like Schengen, like again, Eurozone, like defense agency. Now we are discussing maybe that there is a need to create, uh, create health, EU, uh, health union health union because of in order to be ready and prepared much better than we were for this pandemic situations as we are confronted right now. But this is a different integration. And here you have the variations of the relations of the EU with third countries in legal in terms of legal regimes and then how much they are integrated into the uh, structures. This is the Slovak interest as I started my presentations from here. You know, regardless of the political, I mean, membership, institutional membership of Ukraine, Eastern Partnership countries, we want them to be integrated, at least into the single market, and to as many sort of the sectoral and common policies of the European Union, Union as, as possible. So this is the logic. And here, I will show you firstly all the map, uh, I mean, the table. Is a two pages because if I would put it in one page, it would be impossible to read it. But we did a comparative uh, analysis of all those sectoral, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, legal regimes of the EU with EA countries. This is the first Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Swiss bilateralism, because actually Switzerland. Uh, they, because there was no vote uh, referenda in Switzerland, and you know, this is a sort of the referenda country ruled by the referendas. Uh, government was prohibited simply by the public uh, referenda to establish one comprehensive agreement with the European Union. Therefore, actually, we have 120 and more bilateral agreements between Switzerland and the European Union. So we have two types. We have Actually, we have two types of legal regime, how it might be developed with third countries, EA agreement, comprehensive one agreement, almost close to the membership agreement. And then we have like Swiss bilater bil bilateralism, it's, it's a very specific notion, which is in that is the same, but it's not one agreement, 120 agreements. In 2007, when I was invited by a German uh, federal uh, foreign ministry, when they were preparing their 
uh, presidency 2007, two years before the Eastern Partnership was launched, actually position of Germany was that let's develop our structural relations with Eastern partners following Swiss model. Let's start from sectorial policies and go step by step. Let's integrate first like energy sector, then you know competition policy, whatever transport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These those 28 you know sectors of the EU. Let's go step by step, make open gradually the market and simply work with the partnership countries so that simply they are getting in. But this was overrode by the Georgia war. Russia, Georgia war 2008. I'm sure that if Germans would continue in implementing the sectoral approach, today there would be no maybe, like with relations with Ukraine association agreement, but we, we would have maybe 20 bilateral sectoral agreements about working, you know, step by step. Let's manage one sectoral policy, second sectoral, and go this way. So you have two strategic models. And here, and I'm, I mean, it gives us room to thinking how to deepen the association process of the Eastern Partnership countries. Here, uh, actually, we did this comparative analysis uh, following four main indicators. Range of scope of harmonization is how much a key communitaire those contract, contracted, contracted countries should absorb. Second, legal quality whether it should be like a case of Norway, 100% copy. There's no room for discussion. You have to simply, Norwegians call it as a fax democracy, but these are older texts from the 80s and 90s when fax was used. Actually, there's a fax democracy because if fax is coming from Brussels, we have to take it, you know, 100% what is on the fax into our national legislation. Or uh, this is the, the term to uh, harmonization. So if, if you read or simply you, you meet this term, harmonization means it's 100% of absorption. If following the Swiss model, they have a very specific approach, the, I mean the, the method, so-called in German autonomer Nachvollzungrul, it's like automatic, you know, following of the EU key, but there's no sort of the strict regimes like Association Council of how it works in other uh, sort of uh, uh, integration agreements. I call them integration agreements because if you harmonize or approximate your national legislation to the EU key, it is a harmonization. And now it depends simply how we can structure this packages of Aki in a sectoral or comprehensive agreement and the integration process is going on. Yes, it's export Aki. Yes, it's about import Aki, but it's also about the reforms. And uh, so the har uh, what is uh, specific for the Eastern Partnership countries that there is a no harmonization rule, even in case of Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, the EU does not expect that those countries will like copy 100% of the uh, respective EU key, but they, 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 they approximate this approximation process. Harmonization is 100% take over. Approximation is that there is a rule, simply you have to adopt some legislation, then the government like Ukraine reports to Association Council and then it's up to the Council to decide whether it corresponds with the EU key, whether the task was met or not. So it's a different, it's more flexible regime of, of uh, absorption of EU key. We have two in the existing, uh, in the existing uh, practice, legal practice of the EU. So it's, it's still about the question, what's the better? Is it better to let those countries approximize Eastern partners of countries or maybe better to harmonize? Do we trust them that they will in, I mean, do their homework well, so satisfactory manner or not? So these are all the questions. And supervision. In case of EA agreement, there is the most strict sort of supervision because there is a surveillance authority and uh, they have the EFTA court, but the last uh, sort of the decision to interpret the implementation and legal 
conformity and compliance uh, of the of the acquis communautaire and national legislation is European Court of Justice. So actually, the role of by this agreement, when it comes to economical matters, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, they are not part, they are not members of the EU, but actually the rules and decisions of these courts, they are like, you know, so they, they, they are obligatory for them. So many questions about, of course, sovereignty and so on. Why I introduced the Schengen uh, here? Because this is the only sectorial policy where the third countries are fully uh, accepted as a part of the EU institutions. Uh, we have three level of councils, uh, European Council, that is the member states are represented. We have the expert level, the working groups, expert working groups. Then we have the Coreper 1, Coreper 2, Coreper 1 dealing with the single market, Coreper 2 with other policies. And it's on the level of the permanent representatives or ambassadors of the member states. Then we have ministerial level, this, the level of ministers of given sectoral policies. If, there is, if the European Commission offers to amend some legislation or adopt new legislation, it should pass all those three levels. And actually, if you are not a member of the European Union, but you have the agreement, simply you have to follow what will be agreed. Schengen is the only sectoral policy where are the representatives of EA countries in Switzerland, they are sitting together within the Council of the European Union on the expert level, on the corporate level, and on the ministerial level. This is the only policy, these are not member states, but they are fully integrated, they, they, they cannot vote, but they can sit there and talk to EU member states, the experts on those three levels, look, we, are, we agree with this proposal or suggestion to amend the or we are against, and they can raise the argument. Norwegians, they have 300 experts in Brussels on permanent base, and they follow all uh, 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 policies that are included uh, uh, as, uh, in the EA agreement. This is what's important. This is the third inclusion EU structures, policy shaping, because this is also a very important indicator how countries are close to them structures, even if they are not members. As I said, uh, what is important and what is not included into the association agreements of Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and Armenia is the access of the EA countries and uh, Switzerland in some sectoral policies to the comitology committees. Comitology committees, as I highlighted three levels of council, still, you know, below is a level of comitology committees where simply uh, before, uh, it's early stage of the legislation process within the European Union, there are invited not only member states, but also those who concluded integration agreements which means that they have simply have, they have to absorb the EU acquis. They can sit there together with the commission and express the member states arguing that, look, we are against, we are, we are uh, for, etc. So this is, they're not members. They cannot decide once the normal legislating process starts within the EU main institutions, that's council, commission, parliament. But before it starts, they can advise. They can simply be part of the discussion. And I must say that main principle of the, all those uh, discussions at the EU level is a consensus. If Norwegians raise hands saying, look, we are against this because it's bad, we are, so all time others will try to do maximum in order to find a compromise or consensus with Norwegians. So really they can influence really the legislating process, not being members. And if I go below, Turkey, the same Turkey, Turkey has access, experts of Turkey can access to those comitology committees at the early uh, legislation stage, uh, which, uh, which are covered uh, by the customs union agreement. It's Ankara agreement is a special protocol uh, adopted in 1995 to the association agreement of Turkey of 1963, but especially this protocol, so Ankara, Ankara agreement, uh, created customs union. So Turkey is the only candidate country since there is a 
We all understand all this, uh, the, the real situation and the relations between the EU and Turkey, but still is the only formally candidate country which already concluded customs union with the European Union. And they have access to the comitology committees like Norwegians, I mean, uh, Swiss, and, uh, and Turks have. Nothing like that is included into the uh, association agreements concluded uh, with the ambit of the Eastern Partnership. So our main finding, which uh, the main argument, uh, let me just summarize this, uh, how we see the prospects for the deepening of association process with Eastern Partnership countries is that we identify the largest gap between the uh, scope of Aki Communitaire that Ukraine, because we did research on this association agreement of Ukraine, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia should incorporate and the lowest or weakest access of those countries to the EU institutions uh, which already exist in the EU legal practice. It's nothing new. We are still speaking about the non-membership policy, but we see potential how to upgrade institutional cooperation between the EU and those countries from Eastern Partnership that want to go further. And uh, when we had this debate that our Ministry of Foreign Affairs and others so on, some of the ideas were already, I mean, during the reflection meetings, our diplomats uh, presented those ideas, but still uh, they are not well supported by other sort of the member states. But speaking of the Slovakia's East, uh, approach to Eastern Partnership, so I included this very brief reference to our research, how we see prospect. There's definitely, we can find still more balance between scope of harmonization and actually, uh, look, 95% uh, of trade economic related aki should Ukraine harmon ap approximate because it's approximation principle with the EU. 95% is more than Norway because they have more exceptions with some po sectoral policies it's actually the association agreements with DCFTAs are the agreements which um, assume the largest portion of the Aki communitaire to be absorbed by the contracting countries. And the main problem is this disbalance between the scope of approximation and the access to institutions, because those countries do not have access to the comitology committees, they have very limited access to programs and um, EU programs and agencies because you have like 40 agencies and a couple of programs. So there are still, there is a room how to simply make this relationship balance and more closer, I would say, to the EA agreement. And still everything is within the ambit of non-membership perspective, but it might improve integration sort of the mechanism between the EU and those uh, partnership countries. Speaking about very briefly about enhanced cooperation agreement uh, of no Armenia, where to put it here in this perspective, we did not specific research on that agreement, but what I know is that it might be uh, from uh, the two main uh, factors which allow to identify the agreement, whether it's integration sort of agreement or not integration sort of agreement. First is the scope of <clears throat> approximation. Whether the agreement includes preder predetermined portion of a key communitaire that should be absorbed by the national. It is there. From this perspective, Armenian agreement is an integration type of agreement. At the same time, integration agreement is if it in introduces like supremacy of the EU law on given legislative uh, sort of the sectors, I mean, uh, sectorial uh, uh, policies that should be subordinated to the EU law. And from this point, it's not. So it's a mixed type of agreement. 
Of course, uh, there is a, uh, I, uh, simply, uh, maybe it would be interesting to do such research to compare Armenian agreement with the uh, association agreement. So Armen, if you have uh, ideas, we can uh, be open for such collaboration. We can do research together. So we did some research on the existing legal practice. Maybe we can expand it and include the Armenian uh, uh, agreement into this uh, investigation. But uh, we would need to learn more details about that in order to, I, I do not have those details in order to make some general statements now. So this is uh, very briefly how we see, I would say, you know, at least uh, we debate these things, how to, how to deepen the association process with those Eastern partnership countries that are willing to go this way. And finally, my last remark, uh, and I will conclude, uh, COVID-19 crisis and impact of the Eastern partnership. So it's a very specific topic, but difficult to predict. But what is uh, more or less clear, and again, let me refer here to the very concrete example from Slovakia. It's uh, a Jaguar Land Rover company, which produces cars in Nitra. In May, they announced that they are ready to restart the production. They have customers, they order the cars, they can start to again, to, you know, uh, economic activities, but they cannot because of uh, supply of parts they need to complete cars depends on some companies that are based in Asia and some in China. And actually this is a pure loss for them because in, uh, in this situation, if you do not have cooperation with uh, international partners under legal control, simply it simply disqualifies or eliminates your capacities to produce under such situations like we have now this worldwide pandemic. And therefore, I think that the one of the main trends of the, I wouldn't say that is, is the end of globalization, no. But I would say at least some years, unless we will and globally manage the pandemic like this, there will be a strong trend to create regional, world regions or bigger um, sort of the entities of economic activities and here, there are many companies in, in the EU, based in the EU, which announced that they will try to gain control over the supply chains. And simply they have to minimize the dependence on the countries like from China or other, and mostly when we speak about that, so it's about China. And the EU raised the need that actually we have to develop our strateg strategic autonomy Again, nice word, but still simply actually it means that we have to control our own economic activities. Therefore, we have to achieve a certain degree of deglobalization and simply moving back economic activities and capital investments back to the EU market. What it might mean for the Eastern Partnership countries? I would say that it might, if this trend will prove to be a reality, we'll see, but actually it looks like they might benefit from that. Because if you're part of the single market, regardless whether, I mean, you are member states, or, I mean, the companies with the member states or non-member, but if there is a contractual relations with the EU, which simply includes this legal control, okay, and protection on investment and facilities, many of those companies, because of the cheaper, sort of the labor force, et cetera, and other conditions, they might move from China or other Asian countries, which are out of the control, to Eastern Partnership countries. And I see rather uh, business opportunities here than uh, the problems. So from economic terms, I mean, paradoxically, uh, I, I might be wrong, but my prediction is that it might be beneficial for, for the economic and trade relations between EU and Eastern partnership countries. From political perspective, I'm not so optimistic. Why? 
because of Brexit, because of unfinished reforms of Eurozone, and definitely need to address the socioeconomic impacts of the corona crisis. Finally, you know that recently, a couple hours ago, finally the EU leaders agreed about the multi-financial framework for the next seven years, including this 750 billion euro uh, package, which is unprecedented in the history of EU because the EU will, European Commission simply will, you know, <clears throat> uh, take money from the financial markets and we will distribute grants and really uh, very sort of the low cost uh, credits, okay? It's unprecedented, but the priorities there are fully and clearly identified. Green Deal, digitalization of economies. And here the EU will look for the partners which might be helpful in achieving the Green Deal priorities and digitalization priorities. And here the question is, where are the Eastern Partnership countries on the screen of the EU? How much sort of the partner they can be for the EU to help the EU to achieve the goal? So it's, it's natural logic. It's natural, it's not the charity. Foreign policy is not the charity. It's about the partnership and uh, balance sort of the interests because this uh, make the partners real partners. So this is uh, about my presentations. So uh, I'm uh, glad that finally the connection worked and we did it. And now I'm open for your questions you might have and um, we'll be happy to respond. Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for your very comprehensive presentation. And uh, just uh, a few remarks. Of course, we would be happy to have a joint project to compare the association agreements of three Eastern Partnership countries and Armenia's uh, comprehensive and enhanced partnership agreement with the EU. And regarding your one of your final statements about uh, the economy of opportunities provided by the possible change in supply chains. Yeah, I saw some Georgian and Ukrainian publications. They also suggested that they could have an opportunity. And I don't know, maybe you could comment additionally how that would work perhaps in case of Armenia, as we don't have free trade agreement as a part of the association agreement. And uh, I think the unfinished judicial reform and some other issues in Armenia may also be cause a problem in this regard because investors want some guarantees regarding property rights and dispute resolution and so on. And you know, and uh, going to the beginning of your presentation, I think it's even more than 10 years ago already, about 10% of Slovak workforce was in automotive industry, if I'm not mistaken, but from production of steel ending with final assembly. So, and I suppose uh, even more investments came to this sphere in the meantime. Mm -hmm. uh, first to uh, enhance cooperation agreement is very flexible. I mean, agreement of Armenia is very flexible. It's really about the political ability. It's open-ended agreement, actually. There are no like, uh, because yes, the EU respects that Armenia became part of Euro-Asian Union and actually you coordinate your sort of the trade policies with the uh, member of the Euro-Asian Union, but EU is open and still is in line with the EU FTA. Because, you know, we have three types of FTA, free trade agreements, uh, the EU, uh, we have one type, this is a simple FTA agreement, simple or standard, they follow the WTO rules. Actually, the only harmonization or approximation of the procedures, uh, it goes to the public procurement, uh, state aid, it's the so-called Singapore uh, rules of the WTO. It's very basic, but if you want to have a <coughs> good trade 
even FTAs, standard FTAs include some uh, part of the uh, rules. They have to have the same rules, but actually they are completely prescribed by the WTO. It's nothing specific for the European Union. But this is FTA is that actually you agree with some third countries that okay, we will uh, eliminate or identify the tariff and non-tariff sort of the uh, tariffs or non-tariff measures, you know, we will agree and we can uh, simply strengthen the, uh, to facilitate the trade. This is the simple standards agreements. They you concluded in many countries in Africa and Latin America, Mercosur and so on, uh, many other. Then we have integration type of trade liberalization, which I already showed. This is EA agreements, Switzerland, we are structure of bilateral agreements, Turkey, the Western Balkan countries and Eastern Partnership countries. And here it's about the subordination, subordination because actually, yes, this is the EU role or EU law, which is exported via those contract agreements. It's a different, and here we go deeply. We harmonize standards, because if you want to produce export cars, you have to meet the standards. And if you want to be a part of the market, you should follow the same standards for all actors on the market. And therefore, why we have this aki sort of the exports and all this relationship. And then we have the next generation of FTA agreements. And this is with the EU, EU concluded with the developed countries like Japan, uh, South Korea, Canada. Unfortunately, not with the United States because the Trump administration decided to depart from talks. But what is the specific of those agreements with developed countries? They include the principle of the convergence in the future. So that we agree with Japanese that, okay, we have this sort of the sectoral policy like car industry, and we are gradually getting closer and closer converging the Aki in the future. So we have three types of models, how FTA might work, single standard based just on WTO rules. Then we have this integration type of agreements that means that yes, the single market and those who are on it so approve the rules. And if you want to be part of it, you have to accept it. And the third sort of the agreements with the developed countries, which include the principle of convergence. And here I do not exclude in theory that sometime, I mean, in some time there will be a situation where the EU can enjoy with the, I mean, to, to, in, to be engaged with the Eurasian Union into talk, whether we can go to this convergence type of agreement. Because this is about the relation with Russia. Okay, so Russians say we, and I mean, uh, the Eurasian Union definitely saw the number player number one there is Russia. And if the Russians saying that we do not want to harmonize or approximate to the EU key, okay, so maybe this might be a model. And if Armenia will follow the talks of Eurasian Union with the European Union, that sometime in the future, there will be such talks and we will might agree the agreement, which will include the convergence principle, not integration, like subordinated integration if you want, but this the, the, uh, our legislation frameworks on the contract between the EU, based on the contract between the EU and the Euro will go closer to each other, like we have it, the EU has it with Japan, South Korea, Canada, actually. So these are three types. And, you know, if you, again, why it's important to study those legal variabilities of the EU relations. Because EU is a legalistic project. If you want to have an integrated like 27 member states, it's based on, it's pure legalism. You cannot integrate the countries if you do not have this very strong legal component. And if you want to understand how the EU, what, what are, options for the EU to have to develop relations with third countries, you should learn how works it, I mean, the legal practice of the EU, how it works, uh, how it works with the third countries. Then you can see modalities, then you can see some okay, and, and I think even like I showed you, 
Still, we are speaking about non-membership of Eastern countries with DCFT agreements, okay? But there is a plenty of institutional, you know, options how to upgrade the relationship, how to make it more effective. So, uh, enhanced, uh, I said already, the enhanced cooperation agreement of Armenia is very flexible because actually it's about the willingness of the government of Armenia to go into some integration deeper bilaterally, consulting the partners in the Eurasian Union, but it's up to your government to decide how much, what you want to absorb, what you will negotiate with your partners in the Eurasian Union that actually, so you are interested to go deeper in some sectorial policies, it's interesting for you. But it's really, it gives all the cards in the hands of Armenian government, how you will manage this uh, relationship is very flexible. He was open to go, if you want, this CFT way. It's ready. It expected Armenia to be part of the process and other member states, I mean the part, uh, participating state, but it happens that it happens. It's about political decisions, but from legal uh, nature of the agreement, I mean, it's very flexible. It gives all options to Armenia to go as far when it comes to the economic integration EU as it is willing and how it is, uh, how it can manage in its relations with the Eurasian uh, member states. So it's open. And uh, then uh, your question was, actually, uh, we are in a very difficult situation now and not only, I mean, Slovakia, all countries actually, they are affected deeply by mm, this pandemic. We are counting, uh, I mean, the negative impacts and actually Slovakia will be one of the most hit uh, EU member states. Following the predictions of our Ministry of Finance, we, the GDP decline uh, this year will be like around 10, minus 10%, which is one of the top, because of car industry, because of so a uh, large sort of portion of car industry. Slovakia is the most industrialized EU member state. 26% of our GDP is produced by industry. In most of the countries, you can see that the, the dominant sh uh, share have services uh, and so on. Not economic, like this traditional sort of the, you know, the production. So, uh, therefore, still the debate is only starting. Finally, we understood now that we will receive like 7.5 billion euros for the recovery fund in Slovakia, in addition to the standard EU budget. Actually, our prime minister announced uh, yesterday, um, um, to, seems to yes, that we will uh, uh, get like 43 billion euros if we combine the EU st funds, structural funds we will receive um, from uh, the EU, plus this additional specific, this recovery fund, altogether we will receive like 43 billion euros from uh, EU in order to invest into the modernization of economy. It's a lot of money. It's like almost two annual state budgets because actually so state budget Slovakia is like around 18, 90 billion, billion euros incomes and expenditures plus minus, but uh, 43 in addition. So it really gives us some capacities of Slovakia, Slovak government, but now we have to identify the strategy and it should be aligned with the Green Deal, energy technologies, <clears throat> energy savings and uh, transformation of economy to hydro, hydro carbon neutral economy by 2050. That means that elimination of the use of oil, of, of crude oil, I mean oil, gas, coal, and simply new technologies, new investments into the network, electricity networks, because actually you know that all those existing networks, especially in our part of world, former communist bloc were constructed like uh, for very a lot of big uh, generation centers and a couple of them, nuclear. You have nuclear plant, it's a permanent, a huge source of energy and you have the, you, to adapt the electricity, I mean the network, I mean the pressure there.
okay? But if you go for photovoltaics, for wind of energy, water, etc., so you have a growing number of small sources, you have to adapt electricity networks so that they can, they, they, they do not collapse and simply uh, incapacity to transmit electricity, you know, where it's needed. So it's a huge new infrastructural investment ahead. I mean, in the old EU, if we are serious with the Green Deal, that means electrification of everything. Electrification, so it is a old Lenin's motto, electrification, electrif <laughs> I do not remember exactly, but it's again for the EU, electrification, electrification, and electrification. It, it means making the buildings a new electro electricity generating factories. Now it's really, we have a big debate between those who want to preserve the central system of uh, energy supply, heating and water and so on, to those who want to make buildings like self, not only self-sufficient, but even producing more energy than they need, electricity and warm heat. So in all this debate, so this will be a new, this is a real chance to invest in the new generation of infrastructure, which will change the, the, the economy and things how we live, how we, you know, use everything. Because gen energy is about generation, transmission and consumption. You also have to invest into consumption in order to ensure, I mean, the energy efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, savings. So this will be the main agenda. Uh, we are quite strong in some sectors of, uh, of industry, including IT technologies. I would refer here to company Asset. I don't know which antivirus program you use in your computers. It might happen that it is Asset. It's a Slovak uh, company con uh, established. Now it's one of the leader in the world and the global market with antivirus programs and so on. So there are, we, uh, there are some rumors actually that we want to invest more into at least uh, this ambition of our new Minister of Economy that we should invest into hydrogen technologies like uh, technical units in Kosice they develop, they have, they, they invented already some um, solutions for cars that can use hyd hydrogen instead of, you know, uh, fuel, classical fuel based on oil or whatever. So we'll see, but definitely it will be not the car industry which will be supported. We rather expect that we will pay this price for next transformation of Slovak economy. I mean, uh, uh, or the, the, the sector will be completely changed. I mean, because actually it's about the electricity cars. So we cannot produce simply the old fashioned types of cars on fuel, okay? And, you know, investors came from abroad. They can move, how they came, they can also move from Slovakia. So therefore, I do not think that the car industry, preserving jobs, yes, from some transition period, the government will have to pay, invest to preserve the jobs there, but at the same time to develop other, you know, areas of activity so where people can move. Like we are closing, I mean, the Slovakia is the first of the new EU member states who, of course, also thanks to the support of the European Commission, decided to coal mining in Slovakia. By 2003, a new Minister of Economy says that actually we can close it by the next year. We will stop completely coal mining in Slovakia. And it's, again, 4,000 jobs and 4,000 jobs plus three, four members because these are, you know, people with, with their families and you have like 12, 15,000 people and you have to invent something for them to support their new activities, requalification, et cetera, et cetera. So I would see that rather we can use this investment package, which we will receive from the EU to restructure again Slovak economy, it will be the third re reconstruction. The first one were going from military industry to car industry. And now it will be from car industry to something new and other areas, because I do not think that this might be sustainable and long-term 
uh, in, in long term uh, perspective. Yeah, thank you very much. And now uh, let me pass the floor to Officer Pushkita. I do not hear you. And now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and uh, your comments. And I have uh, two questions uh, about uh, Slovak Armenian relationships and the, and the future of this relationship. So, so the first question is about the perspectives of uh, Slovak Armenian economic and political relationships in the framework of the SEPA agreement. I suppose that although Armenia became a member of Eurasian Union, but SEPA agreement has a huge potential. So if we achieve the unlocking of its potential and fulfillment of all obligations taken by, by Armenia, we could become even closer to Europe than some of the countries which signed the association agreement and the CFTA with Europe. I mean, first the juridical reforms and fight against corruption, uh, which is in, in the very high level now in Armenia after the revol revolution and reforms in the energy field and achievement of the goals of the European Green Deals also. So uh, do you see the potential of increasing of funds allocated by uh, Slovak uh, government for development the cooperation uh, in different fields of slovak Armenia relationships, including cooperation between the civil societies of our countries? This is the first question, and uh, uh, should I uh, uh, say the second questions also ask, or after the answer? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, definitely. One is the EU legal framework for our relations. It is it creates a frames for our relations because we cannot in bilaterally agree uh, liberalization of trade. So we are limited in developing sorts. Uh, somehow we are limited by this uh, legal framework of relations between the EU and Armenia. Our governments cannot bilaterally uh, introduce tariffs, uh, different tariffs or non-tariff measures in our trade relations. So here the European Commission represents all. So for bilateral trade, so this is a framework. Uh, we would be happy if Armenia is a part of it, because that would simply eliminate all the trade barriers and uh, all those tariffs and non-tariff barriers we have because of the legal regime. But on bilateral level, we cannot change it. This is something which is supranational level we live in. We have to simply respect. We want to have Armenia be part of it. So the same arguments, I can say what I said, vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, Ukraine, and what's the uh, Slovakia's long-term interest. It, it, it goes to all, because the, I mean, the more countries will be part of the integration framework, the more options for our entities to cooperate and, and develop cooperation and so on. So therefore here, uh, we have the, those limits, but still, and maybe Mr. Ambassador can elaborate much better than me, on prospects for bilateral cooperation, I do see uh, plenty of opportunities. Because you know, in the end, the relations and, <laughs> and institutions are about people. It's really about whether you have a good contact there, I mean, here and here, in Yerevan, in Bratislava, whether people know each other, where they can, and it, can, it might start from more intensive exchange of students, of politicians, businesses, you know, so the more contacts there will be, people will know each other and people are very creative, I think, in my country, in Armenia, and actually they can invent, yes, okay, look, so this is a good, it would be good, interesting to, 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 to develop bilateral cooperation on dealing with some very specific activities of, within the Green Deal, why not? I think that Armenia, and also I know that this when I, uh, yesterday Putin, President of Russia, Putin declared five goals, strategic goals for Russia, okay? There was nothing about the Green Deal or uh, so that there's a need uh, uh, to implement the uh, transformation in energy technologies, digitalization, etc. nothing like that. So Russia is still not, you know, looking at this perspective here, 
we see that this is a priority area where we should focus our capacities, knowledge, expertise. If we can develop some bilateral partnerships between Slovaks and Armenians on some I don't know, photovoltaics, uh, new architecture, new buildings, electricity, whatever, you know, it's really a very, very complex agenda. That if, uh, that I, I would be very optimistic. And I, I, I'm sure that Mr. Ambassador, maybe he will work for, for, for supporting such contacts and activities. So this is what I can, uh, I do not, I um, do not know in details like Slovak-Armenian specific relationship in order to elaborate on specifics on that. Yes, uh, also do we have a second question? Yes, if I may. Um, uh, yes, and I, would be, I would be glad, glad if Honorable Ambassador also will make some con uh, comments on that. So the second question is about cooperation between Armenia and Slovakia in security field. Uh, so you know that uh, Armenia have some uh, cooperation uh, with NATO in the framework of uh, IPAP agreement. And I would like to listen to your comment on not a possible enlargement. We know that although EU enlargement <clears throat> is not more popular in the European countries, but the security issues are remain in their crucial importance. So. Uh, uh, I suppose that if Georgia and Ukraine will join NATO, then EAP region, including the Caucasus, will become more secure. So what, your, uh, what is your opinion on that and what is the Slovakia position on that issue? Thank you very much. And uh, uh, by the way, I would like to represent myself. I am from uh, Free Citizen Civic Initiative Support Center, who is uh, closely cooperating with uh, Visegrad countries' uh, partners in the framework of our projects with, uh, uh, funded by International Visegrad Fund. So thank, thank you very you. much. So let me be very brief, because actually all we understand now that the key problem we have in European security is a Russia-Ukraine conflict. And unless this is resolved somehow, and actually unless the fundamentals of the European security architecture and trust uh, I mean, which we had during the 90s. If it is not uh, renewed, restored, simply we will live in less certain, I mean, in more uncertainties, in security uh, that, that it is. And actually, uh, what we, uh, NATO, we consider NATO as a pillar of our defense. We are part of NATO. We support, uh, and especially our new government, with no question, all the NATO activities related to the strengthening the eastern flank, which is an initiative which NATO launched in responding to the Russian aggression against Ukraine and occupation of Crimea. Uh, again, let me again uh, to highlight one very specific Slovak approach here. Slovakia is one of five member states of the EU member states who do not recognize Kosovo. Uh, we decided so because the position was that unless Serbia uh, not recognizes Kosovo, we will not recognize it. And here we have the same argument. Unless Ukraine will not recognize that Crimea is part of Russia, we cannot accept the situation. We look at Kosovo through the position sort of the central government of Serbia. We look to Crimea through the position of the central government of Ukraine because we look at the Helsinki Act and the basic principles that the borders in Europe cannot be changed by the use of military force, what happened. So this is the Slovak position here when it comes to Crimea. And even, even though Slovak, as I said, we have this historical historicist, I would say, pro-Russian sympathy, even those politicians, uh, they, they never declared that they accept uh, occupation of Crimea by Russia, never, you know, Fico and others. So this is the Slovak, very, but we are speaking of the Slovak perspective, so I'm trying to use the, any momentum I have to, to put you some specific on Slovak position. Uh, I think that NATO, should be open to all willing countries. This is a principle of uh, EU and NATO.
two pillars of post, I would say not only post Cold War, but also the Cold War, you know, uh, peace and security order. And those organizations, because they created fundamentals of those orders and the peace we enjoy in Europe for many decades and prosperity we enjoy for many decades. And they should be open to all those countries who want to participate, to cooperate or to be a part of it. Should be open. And uh, here, if we can find some specific link between Slovakia and Armenia to contribute to that process, or to better understanding, more cooperation between NATO and Armenia, we are open to do what we can, what is in our capacity to, to deliver. So I do not exclude that. I mean, and I would say that uh, it, it would be positive. It would be a real contribution to the situation we have right now. So I would support your idea and uh, NATO should be open to those who want to go in and should be not traded. So it's the same like, again, very Slovak peculiarity. We do not like Munchen policy. And you know, Munchen 38, this was a division of the Western powers, it, Hitler and Mussolini that Czechoslovakia, parts of Czechoslovakia will be occupied or given to, to Hitler. We do not like, in Czechs and Slovaks, we, we hate Munchen-like policy, what means that powers of bigger countries simply decide about smaller countries, not having them on the table. This is why we wanted to become part of the EU and NATO, because we are there sitting on one of those are sitting on the table where the issues are discussed and uh, <clears throat> decisions are planned. And we want to have other smaller countries to be a part of the, to sit together with us on the table. So this is how we understand the security policy and the NATO open door and EU open door policy. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, would you like to comment? Yeah, it would be really with great pleasure. First of all, uh, let me express my sincere gratitude to Professor Duleba uh, presentation because uh, really it was excellent and I am personally proud to be a part of it and to represent the Slovak capacities here in Armenia and also to uh, support the implementation of all the capacities of Eastern Partnership and Slovak uh, phenomenon in uh, this format uh, towards Armenia. It is really uh, my great pleasure to participate in it. In this regard, uh, also it would be uh, with great pleasure to support strongly the father cooperation between Professor Duleba and the uh, Center for Policy Studies in uh, Armenia. And uh, really, I would participate uh, on further formats of our cooperation. It will be really my interest too. And regarding the bilateral cooperation, I just would like to mention one uh, very important fact that uh, already I have initiated uh, the bilateral political consultations between the State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Armenia and the Slovak uh, State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs number two, who is uh, covering the portfolio of all those sectors of uh, our interest of bilateral cooperation, starting what uh, already Professor Duleba has mentioned is Slovak development assistance. It's a really great potential on the Slovak side, which could be offered towards Armenia, starting from economic diplomacy through uh, the education, health, uh, agriculture, small farms projects, agro-complex NITRA, our universities specialized in the particular field of uh, concrete development of the cooperation, and also uh, other uh, really parts uh, which are under the roof of economic diplomacy. I would say the cooperation in energy sector, renewable energy, 
and also uh, these uh, Slovak uh, capacities for assistance to develop the civil society and uh, the society as a whole. And this is all under the state secretary number two of the Slovak Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs. And we are organizing, uh, hopefully in November this year, the direct consultations, which will confirm the concept of further development of our bilateral cooperation. And in this format, I see really a great capacities which would be presented in concrete projects of bilateral cooperation between Slovakia and Armenia. This is really the main focus of also my activities, what I am representing here and I am ready to support fully. And uh, if I may use just uh, this opportunity, I would uh, mention only the small fact uh, regarding the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in Armenia. And I just want to mention that Slovakia has participated also in the project of B4 countries representing, represented here in uh, Armenia. Uh, we have increased the money uh, uh, towards Armenia from 10,000 uh, Euro to 25,000 from the fund of International Visegrad Fund. And uh, we have directed uh, this money to the concrete project to uh, Spitak Town. And uh, we assist directly to enable opening of two existing public kindergartens in Spitak. And we have supplied them with equipment uh, with touchless bathroom taps, hand dryers, and remote thermometers. And secondly, we have donated X-ray machine for a newly established medical center in Spitak. And also we have provided uh, socially vulnerable Spitak families with the tablets for distance learning. So it is the concrete assistance from the countries uh, which are represented here in Armenia to solve the pandemic situation in Armenia. So once again, really, I highly appreciate the Professor Duloba presentation and I am completely ready to cooperate fully in further development of this cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. And we have just a few minutes left. So if anybody of the participants would like to ask maybe a question, there is still some time, just a couple of minutes. Uh, now, seems nobody wants to ask any questions anymore so uh thank you once again for joining us today and also those who have been watching the live stream and, uh, <clears throat> uh, we are very much looking forward to future cooperation and uh, parts of today's presentation will certainly be referred to in the publication we are preparing uh, we have one more webinar like this, this Friday, with a Hungarian expert, Andra Stratz, and then uh, me and my colleagues will start to summarize the findings of all four events we've had in July. So, the, the, the paper will be in Armenia and it will be distributed, but uh, hopefully we we'll, perhaps we may also translate it in full or in part and present to larger audiences. So thank you very much for being with us and hope to see you at other events. Uh, I'm also looking forward to future cooperation in different projects. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Armen. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank